like, do you guys manage to try the lab? I thought I wanted to do it, but then I didn't have enough time to do the lab. Um, I couldn't. I uh, didn't have access to Kera, so I couldn't. I mean, I'm using a Jupyter notebook, and it could. I mean, I'm not sure if it's a problem of Jupyter notebook and my computer, or not Jupyter. Sorry, mm, Anaconda. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm using that kind of like interface to use Python, and I couldn't get uh, to TensorFlow. Keras for R didn't work mainly because I have to install the packages first on Anaconda. I'm not sure if I'm, if it's a problem with the way I installed the <clears throat> Anaconda package or it's something with the Anaconda itself. Yeah, I, I have this question as well because um, I tried to run it on R based on the lab like a few months ago, but then it didn't work out. So I wonder if was it something wrong with the way I installed the packages? Because it seems did not work. Then that time was like, I thought I want to do it on my VS code or something else. But then I just <laughs> forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like there's, is there a like, tutorial on like, how to install it? Because it seems a bit different or difficult to install the packages. I don't know whether it was because of the dependencies. I do not have like depend, they were not auto install when I install the Paris package. Mm, I no idea do you mean as an independent package or? Yeah, um, like, do they rely on any dependencies? That's why like, I could not install it successfully. I have like, no idea, I know but it seems like more, it's a more difficult package to install. Yeah, mm, maybe we should or could start something in the book club or um, another thread. Do we have help or Keras? I do. Do we have that? Um, I can't see. I I can't see something like that. If our model, under, our Wrangler, our data. It should be under the R model, I think, or like. That should be the general, or maybe it was just under the Python. Um, Python general. Yeah, but it seems to be, I feel like the package. I found something very interesting. Oh. So in March 11th, John the Geek said, I haven't actually gone through the lab yet. He's talking about chapter 10. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it seems other people had like some Keras version problem. <laughs> so I think that's the problem in R because it's supposed to be like Python kind of like packages, not R packages. That's why we always yeah. have trouble installing it in R. Yeah. So yeah, I just need the time to do try to work it out on the VS Code or Atom. <laughs> I feel like VS Code should be fine, I think. I've it's... been avoiding VS Code for a long time. I it's just I don't know. too much VS Code. <laughs> so I yeah. hate it. <laughs> but it seems to be the more reliable one. I just need to install the extension, I think. Uh... So John suggests to go to the second link, which is the Torch version, like the PyTorch version of the lab. Um, it doesn't use Python as, uh, as an intermediate, right? Like Keras does. So I mm -hmm. find it much easier work to work with it. This is what John said. Um, maybe if, this is four months ago. Maybe we should do oh. a follow up on this. We have to Jupyter. Oh, yeah, they have the Jupyter Notebook files on chapter 10, it seems. The Torch version and the Keras version. Oh, so this might work, I think. Let me download and see how it goes. Okay, so uh, I guess what we can do is continue um, for now. Mm -hmm. 
and when we get to the lab, see what, what how much time we have left at the end and if we can cover the lab next week or we can come up with a solution for the problems we have for the lab next week, right? Yeah. Um, next week, Nile is supposed to present, but I guess it's fine if we try to like figure out the lab. Just I want mm -hmm. to like see how we can set things up and to okay. see if is it possible to do it in R or do we really just have to do it in the Python? Yeah. Like, like yes, <clears throat> but like Jupyter. Okay. Let's okay. start. Let's start then. Okay, I'm going to share my um, window that has the pictures. I took pictures of the book. So I hope you can see my screen. Let's start. <clears throat> so last time, this is where we stopped essentially. Uh, see, and because of my connection, I will stop my video. Sorry for that. Okay. So last Thank time, uh, we covered the basics of neural network and we covered the com uh, convolution neural network, CNNs, and we got to the point that we were covering, we started covering recurrent, recurrent neural networks, RNN. Essentially what, uh, we, what, what, we ex uh, ex what we went through was CNNs are used for image classification and interpreting images <clears throat> using uh, deep learning uh, tools. Here we want to go over the text. And the last thing that we ended with before this section was going through IMDB film reviews uh, using the CNNs and the back of word method, method. And essentially uh, it was taking the input, which was the paragraph, cutting the, the extra things out, extra words, and come up with some specific words and score those words try to find a pattern based off, to, based off of those words and assign good sentiment or bad sen sentiment to those reviews at the end. Um, here, what we go through is essentially, we are in the R RNN, we are uh, dealing with the databases or samples that are, that are sequential in nature. Something like uh, documents, that has like uh, the sequence and relative position of words has a meaning and can impact the sentiment of the paragraph. Time series like forecasting rainfall, wind speed, air quality, etc. Et and same thing applies to the financial time series, like time series in general and financial time series especially because financial time series can have their own derivatives on stocks, bonds, etc. As we will go through <clears throat> later. <clears throat> recorded speech, it has the same context as the, uh, as the first category documents, because first you want, you want to uh, assign patterns to the words and then sequence of words um, can have a meaning, can change the sentiment. So recorded speech, musical recording, that the, the, those kind of things have the same um, concept around them. Handwriting essentially like doctor's notes, and uh, zip codes, those kind of those um, sequences also can be carried out and um, deciphered using uh, RN, RNN. And essentially, what happens is we have we can have this the first the left hand side of the equal sign as a general uh, in general form of how it's going. Uh, we have XL as the input; it goes through a weighing. Uh, process and then we have an, a hidden layer which is activation layer AL and then uh, we have two outputs we have the output L and then U which provides feedback to the next activation layer and then at the end we have Y if we expand that we get to the right hand side we have the first input it goes through the weighing process and then we have the first activation A1 and then it provides the O1 output one, and then it provides some feedback for the next activation. So A2 has some feedback from the first word. A3 has some feedback from activations of the first two words and so on. And that's how the activations are getting feedback from the previous word, words. And that's where the sequence comes into play. The interesting po point here is O1, O2, O3, they don't have any direct 
output y, i, y2, y3. The only output we have is ol at the end, which, 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 at, which give us like y, just one y. And essentially ol is a function of the previous o outputs because al had feedback from previous activations. And that's how you can see the sequence of Xs impacts the As and is the sequence of As they reflect in AL and then reflect in OL. And then it, the final thing uh, is reflected to the output Y. So we have uh, one thing to uh, simplify the path is to simplify the weights used, which are the feedbacks and Bs. And essentially we use the same collection of weights W, U, and uh, B matrices for each element of the sequence. So like if A2 gets 10% feedback from A1, A3 gets another, the same 10% from A2 and so on and so forth. Then that goes through. I will explain where that comes into play later. So, Okay, so imagine uh, going back to the IMDB review database that we had, uh, imagine each paragraph is broken down to the sequence of words. Each of them will be one input XL. The order of, which, uh, the order of words and uh, the closeness of certain words in, in a sentence can convey the semantic meaning or the sentiment of the paragraph. The output Y again uh, can also be a, sequence, which is essentially a sequence of OL, OL minus one, all the way to the ON, or can be interpreted independently as just OL. <clears throat> when it comes to the play, to play is in, a, in the example of translation, when we have a text that is being translated. In that case, uh, we have Y would be, a, uh, would be a sequence or a matrix pretty much like the input. When we have we are translating from one language to another one. Um, so for uh, I'm looking for the equation. Is it this one? Yes. Okay. So each activation goes through essentially each function and activation goes through a, a series like this. So each output is equals to beta zero plus a summation of betas uh, times activations. Beta is elements of the matrix B. And then A, the activation is coming from this equation 1016 up here. We have an initial uh, zero, a omega or W K zero for each activation plus summation of Ws times the inputs plus summation of U's, which is feedback from AL minus ones, which is the feedback from the steps before. So what we want to do is essentially to optimize this. And um, I didn't take a picture of the, what we want to optimize. So what we want to optimize here is for, we have OLs and then O capital L, is the uh, the parameter that the, or the output that we want to optimize. So we, if we go through the loss functions that we had in previous chapters, we go through equation 1018, which and we want to minimize that y minus ol squared, and essentially go from there. Um, okay. Now, from there, we can go through the examples that we had for the for these categories. Essentially, we have two examples here. The first one is about the documents, which is essentially the IMDB reviews. And it's instead of using the bag of words, now we want to, to use another method, which is the, these RNNs. What we, they do is, they break down each sentence like the line that you see here in, in this middle. It says, this is one of the best films actually, uh, the best I've ever, this is one of the best films, actually the best I've ever seen. 
the film starts one full day. Okay, so they, they break down this sentence into one hot method. And if you have, if you're wondering what is one hot method, I didn't know the answer, so I looked into Wikipedia. Essentially, it changes anything, any combination. It's like a diction dictionary that changes the words and assigns uh, a series of zeros and one one to it. So imagine uh, you have a dictionary and uh, for each word or for, for each input, you have an array of zeros and one one. The location of one decides which element in the dictionary uh, you're uh, referring to. So it's um, essentially you can read the definition from Wikipedia and how it looks like is this. The, sim the similar version in machine learning is uh, the dummy variables that we had previously. It's mostly used in the natural language processing and sometimes the statistical works in machine learning. Here you have like in the table that you have the label encoding foods food names, apple, chicken, broccoli, and categories one, two, three, and calories. What the way one hot encoding works is you break down to columns, one apple, one chicken, one broccoli, and you assign one to the one that had apple, and it goes zero for the rest of them, and then the calories. Same thing is being used here. So you have this, the word this, and you have, all of the zeros that are shown in the gray um, squares and one, the one that shows that it shows up as the black square. And if you follow all of the columns, you see none of them is black in this row. For is the first uh, square, the lowest square is blacked out and none of the other ones is blacked out. And you can see how the ones are located. So essentially that means if you have a dictionary of 10,000 words, each word for each word in a paragraph, you have a, an area of 10,000. Although one of them is zero, but still you have a problem with the dimension. It's a huge 9,999 9, zeros and just one one. It's a huge problem. What the way they, uh, we solve the problem is using the embedding uh, embedding method. Essentially, instead of translating it to this dictionary format, we reduce it to a five. Here in this example, it's M of five. So we reduce it to M dimension, M as Mike, my M di dimensional space with a number of uh, digits in each of those locations. So as you can see, uh, for each word, we have five squares. Each square gets, uh, has gotten a value. So it can vary from zero to the max uh, value that we assign to that, uh, to the words, to the word setting. And this is this combination of these five numbers is gonna be unique for each word. Those are M real numbers and typically they are not zero. Um, Oh, I hope it made sense so far. Um, so we can go through two ways now. Um, this embedded uh, matrix for each word can be designated with capital E. If you read the text, it's, it is designated with E. So E, that embedded uh, matrix can be found through two ways. The, fir the first route is just through the learning. Give the, sample, give the method some database and some words, it will learn and, ex, uh, and extract the meaning out of, that, um, out of that training data set. The second way is to use the very well-known uh, trained, pre-trained matrices uh, like word to vec word number two, VEC, and GLOVE. GLOVE or GLOVE method. And if you, we do that, they are called, this is called weight freezing. We are using pre-trained databases for words and we can apply those. And we can show how, I mean, we can test them and see how different they are. Um, 
the idea is that the position of words in the embedded embedding space pre uh, preserve the semantic meaning, meaning that the syn synonymous words should appear very close to each other, like regarding the location. Um, Okay, so what they did, they went through the method, the IMDB database using the using tr the embedded layer, embedded matrix, and they trained the method, um, and they got seventy six percent accuracy on the database when they trained the when they used the glob, um, the glob pre trained matrix. Uh, the result they got was interestingly slightly worse. So not all the time using the embedded method would work for, for us. Um, the, the solution to that is to use more, more elaborate version, which is called long-term and short-term memory, um, long-term and short-term memory. And there are two, so instead of having one layer, they uh, create two, uh, la two hidden layers and each hidden layer has its own activation. So we have two sets of activation and activation of level two gets feedback from activation level one. Um, we will, I'm trying to find where that is. I did not take the proper picture. Oh, here. So a simple RNN is the first one which is on the left-hand side. Essentially, you have one input, you want feedback from the previous uh, section, you have the activation, then you have the output and feedback to the next layer. The LSTM, long-term and short-term memory, it has the input from, it has the input, it has the feedback. The feedback goes through a series of complex processes and also feedback from the other layer gives the another set of feedback to the next layer and then goes to the output with one condition. We have two, one output and two feedbacks going to the next two levels, essentially. GRU, I haven't discovered yet, but I found this picture off of Google. So you can imagine things can get even more complex. Uh, the book didn't go through the details of the LSTM method. Um, apparently because of the complex math mathematics on the behind it and how the activation layers are connected to each other. But when they applied the LSTM method, they, the performance improved from 76% to 87%. Just a note, just a reminder, when we use CN, when they use CNN, the accuracy was 88%. So LSTM provided uh, similar accuracy to the uh, CNN method. The caveat here is LSTM will take long time to get trained, which is pretty much expected because we have two levels of activations to train. Uh, okay, so with that, now we can move to um, the next time, the next set of time series. Um, remember, we, we were working on the documents. Now we want to work on time series and especially financial time series. And the very well known time, financial time series is essentially stock exchanges and how stocks are being traded. The problem is stocks themselves, the price of the stocks is very hard or almost, almost, almost impossible to predict. The way to the the way the way we go around it is we look at the trading volume. So the first top level top row shows the trading volume log of trading trading volume between uh, 1962 to 1986 for each day. So the average trading volume for each day is shown on the log of that is shown on the first graph, and the second graph is show, is showing the Dow Jones DJI. Uh, return and the log of volatility is shown down here. Volatility essentially how much variation we had from day to day. Okay. 
the the detailed description of each of these uh, are sh are shown here. So <coughs> log of trading volume is the fraction of all outstanding shares that are traded on that day relative to a hundred day moving average of the past on the now on the log scale. DJI is the difference between the log of Dow Jones Industrial Index on consecutive trading days <coughs> and log volatility is based on a based on the absolute values of daily prices movements. Uh, I guess over the past two years we heard a lot about the uh, financial data so I'm skipping those but if this is not making sense just let me know I can pause and and go over them. But when they looked at this, essentially they um, we have three inputs: the log volume, Dow Jones industry, the DJI return, and um, log volatility. The way they reflected it is using a three-level, three, level, three uh, argument matrix showing V R Z, volume return Z for volatility, and in, on each day we have these three numbers. These inputs and we have total total of 6,551 um, triplets essentially. So one thing that is important here is these inputs on a daily basis, they are not exactly independent of each other, but they are not dependent on, on each other. That's the, diff the main difference of difference between financial series and the series from the past. So uh, the, the wordings in documents, they have some connection and they, each word has some relative ties to the previous words. Here, one day the market can go high and then the next day people come can come in and they say, uh, I don't feel like we are doing good. So it can go all the way down. However, there is a limit to that. So that swing, that emotional swing has a limit, although it shows uh, no direct um, connection to the previous days. So the values can be, uh, they are, they ex so the book says they, the values, exhibit autocorrelation, meaning that they don't exactly match, but they don't exactly trend, but they have some correlation. They show some relative um, tendency, tendency to fall close to each other. So what they, uh, what, when they, when we do the analysis of these time series, we can, what we can do is to look at the previous days we can go one day before, two days before, three days before, go from five days before, two, three days before, and look at the correlation, the other auto correlation between those days before the actual day that we are looking at. That, mean, uh, that is the definition of lag. And what they did in an analyzing this data, they went up to 37 days. And this is the result. Essentially, they went one day, two days, three days. So the horizontal axis it shows is showing the amount of lag, the number of days that they tracked back and they looked at the correlation of the X number of days before that day and see how much they are correlated. And as you can see, the first five days, they have a high correlation, more than 40, 50%. And as it goes down to 20 days, it's going slowly down with uh, at, at 20 days lag, we have a correlation more than 20%, which is interesting. Okay. So the way uh, this analysis is, uh, the, uh, there's another way that this analysis is different from the, uh, the word um, method. So the document time series. In the documents time series for each input, we first of all, we had uh, 25,000 reviews. Each review was one string, one series. Here we have the time series, all of it together is one series. There, it, we, we don't have 25,000 
uh, time series. We have one time series and the structure of the data is a bit different. The second difference is the whole thing, the entire series targets the volume and the inputs include the past values of this series. So what they did um, to do the analysis is essentially they, create, they created the target Y, the volume of the day. And the volume of the day was a target of three vectors, three XLs or three inputs. The volume, the log volume, the uh, return and volatility from uh, T minus L, T minus L plus one, all the way up to T minus one. So they assigned a lag they went X number of days, those number of days lag behind. And then they had three parameters for each, um, each of the lags. The output of the, the output here is shown on, with orange. So the black line is showing the actual volume. The orange one is showing the predicted volume, predicted volume using um, the number of days they assigned for lag, which is five. So they, they use five days lag and they went off of that. So initially they broke down the data into two thirds for training, one third for test. The result of that was 42% of uh, variant, variance, R squared equals to 42%. Uh, And okay, so that's that for the time series prediction here. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out was this, essentially, oh, before going to this. So the summary of RNNs um, is provided in uh, page 400. 31 of the PDF. Uh, and essentially it says that we can, we can use two approaches to do the analysis to, for the RNNs. We can use the typical approach to start from the beginning of the time series, go all the way to the end. And then at the end, we have one output and then we can decide uh, how the output performed, if was it good enough or not. The other way, is to use bidirectional RNN. And essentially it means that you can use from either center go to the ends or from start from the beginning and end at the, at the same time and go to the center, depending on how you go through the series. It's pretty much like a for loop, uh, whether you want to start from zero, go to N or go uh, with steps of plus one or go from N to zero with steps of negative one. So, or start from divided into two for loops. One starts from the middle, goes to one end. One starts from the middle, goes to the other end. And if we use that method, it's uh, it's particularly used in language translation, uh, which is in which we, it's important for us to know the sequence of the words and the output of the method, the uh, deep learning method is going to be another time series. That's called seek to seek, S E Q number two SEQ and the hidden units are thought in that method are thought to capture the semantic me meaning of the sentences. So now we go to essentially the fundamental question that sometimes deep learning methods are showing very similar uh, results to each other. CNN shows similar methods, um, similar results to RNN. Uh, and it can be confusing. CNN used, is used for pictures. It's used for the uh, <coughs> auto -diagnos diagnosis of mammograms, ophthalmology eye scans, and our MRI uh, annotation. Um, how, while RNN is used for forecasting and document modeling. So should we discard all of the previous methods that we had? All, um, 
and just use the uh, deep learning method. Essentially, here we are, uh, the authors are discussing that not necessarily we should do that. The main thing, the main argument is coming from what we discuss with what they discussed in chapter six using the hitters database. Essentially, in that database, we track the hitters, the salary of hitters, and we were trying to predict their salary. It's kind of a time series, right? A financial time series. When they clean the data and they split it into uh, training and test, they use three methods, the linear regression method, and it had 20 parameters. Then they used linear regression method plus lasso reg regularization. And the tuning parameter was selected by cross validation. And then they used neural network using 64 rel u. And the result is reflected here, as you can see. So for each of the models, the mean absolute error was very close to each other. Lasso was the best of the three. Linear regression with lasso essentially was the best of the three regarding the absolute error. So the test R squared um, was kind of similar where they had very close R squared results. So does this mean that deep learning methods are not good and you should go to simple method? That's the argument that we have to do. Sometimes uh, does others suggest that in cases like this, we should probably follow the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna butcher the word, but Occam's razor principle, essentially, Question. yes. Yeah, so now we have these three models, right? And their mean absolute error is like very similar. Their R squared is very similar. Is there a way to like test to see which of these models are like significantly better or we just have to base it on our judgment to see which is the better one so that's essentially exactly the argument with the mm. Occam's razor it says that when you have this kind of situation mm. just don't uh, don't dig deep mm. into like the details of the method just use the simplest version without oh. um, like mm. over complicating so the actual words are is this when faced with several methods that give roughly equivalent performance pick the simplest yeah because you see for neural network the parameters is like in thousands so i mm -hmm. assume that will take a very long time to compute <laughs> right yeah exactly so it seems like lasso or linear regression seems to be the better one because they are not significant i feel like the point is just an increase in like how many three three point something so it's not a mm -hmm. lot to like spend all the time on neural network <laughs> yeah yeah so here i is my assumption was mm -hmm. and probably the author's assumption was although the number of parameters are the same let's not discuss the time that it takes to train the network the, the model mm -hmm. if we put that aside go with the simplest one but if we add the argument about the time, I'm pretty sure the neural network will take way longer time to do, to, to get trained. And then that essentially increases the cost of uh, doing the modeling. And I would say that that alone says, okay, just go to linear regression without any problem. You do it in, in a blink and it goes very fast. Mm. Actually, the authors say, when they, instead of using, when they used linear regression with another regularization method called relaxed lasso, they got the best result. The mean absolute error was 228 compared to 250 something. So linear regression with relaxed lasso was the best compared to all three of them, 228 for the mean absolute, uh, the mean absolute error. So, there is always this argument of selection bias and the, the book argues uh, whenever you have how to deal essentially with such situation and um, explains how to go around it, how to find um, the, fit the fittest model, the simplest model. 
not all the time, not. So going to the most complex version doesn't give us the best result all the time. That's what they are trying to do uh, to say, although it's fancier, although it has more parameters and seems to be working better. Then it goes to the next section, actually talking about uh, fitting a neural network. It explains in details about how to fit it, how the mathematical processes are working in the background. Essentially, it's, it explains that in the neural network, we are trying to minimize this function. Uh, so we have the yi as the output. f of x is going to be the um, simulation or the outcome of the model. And we want to minimize this error. Uh, at the end and come up with the best result that we can. And we always have a problem when we, we do the minimum, uh, minim, min, when we are dealing with minim, uh, the optimization problem. Like when we want to find the minimum on this R theta curve, we have one local curve here, sorry, one local minimum at around negative 0.5 and one absolute or global minimum here too. It could be, depending on where we start, we could easily fall into the trap of detecting this. And how it this finding uh, minimum is working is you start one, you start from a point, you guess a theta zero, you read the value, and then you try to find a, mm, change the theta with a tiny about, amount, tiny bit, and see if the r theta one is less than r theta zero. And if it's less, it means that, okay, your variation was good. You're going downhill to, the, to find the minim, minimum position. So you change it a bit more, either increase or decrease and see how fast you're going down all the way to the point that you get to the minimum. Not, so changing theta zero can change whether you find this, the, the minimum on the right hand side or minimum that is designated with theta seven. So there is a pitfall there and it's very uh, important not to fall into that pitfall when we are doing uh, this kind of problem, this kind of optimization uh, or this kind of trying to find a minimum for least square error. So there are two methods to overcome this. One of them is slow learning, which means that the gradients and the variation in theta is small or regularization, meaning that instead of going from the left picture that each uh, activation gets feedback from all the inputs, maybe we should drop some of them. Maybe we should, uh, as you can see, the first purple on top on the right-hand side, just gets the input from three, not all the four ones. So that leads into dropout, dropout learning method. <coughs> so it means that we don't need to get feedback from every single input. And then the final output doesn't need to get feedback from all, every single activation. So, as you can see, there are so many variations into this method and so many complexities that can create a very, uh, so instead of can derive, uh, can, sorry, can deviate us from focusing on the actual problem into focusing on, oh, we have an optimization problem. So it can be two different worlds and we need to be kind of careful about how we're going around it. So sections 10, Seven and 10.8 are trying to address this issue, co cover all the bases and mm, try to explain because the mathematics of it, they constantly say the mathematics of it are, are out of scope of this book. So in section 10.8, they try to, dis to explain the problem of interpolation and double descent. What they're trying to say is, in the extension, in the extent of the same conversation, that we should be careful about how what we are using, what kind of model we are using for, for what kind of problem, they they start to explain, not this one, that for finding the interpolation, in some cases uh, the problem is is going to be simple 
all the way down to one interpolation finding uh, problem. So in those problems, we don't have any training data. We just have the test. And in those kind of situations, sometimes uh, we get better results. An example of it is this. So essentially it means that sometimes we, without any training, we get good level of error. But as we increase the amount of training, suddenly the error goes all the way up. And then we need to increase the training significantly to another level. And then again, it starts to slow down. So that's what uh, that's called a double descent uh, phenomenon. And it happens the a good explanation of it is this, finding the approximation to the y equals to sine of x, the sine function, using um, 20 observations. So the first top, top left picture is showing the linear model that uses uh, eight degrees of freedom. And as you can see, it has a good level of uh, approximation. As we increase the degrees of freedom to 20, you can see there is a deviation and the error goes significantly high. The bottom pictures are increasing the, are the, showing the other side of the curve. So we pass that 20 or 30 um, degrees of freedom. Now at 42, we are showing good level of ag agreement between our pr prediction versus the actual num actual function. However, we can see the problem of overfitting with these jumps in the middle. And at 80, um, the fitting seems to be good, but the complexity of the outcome is very high. So that's essentially showing that this end of this right end of this uh, curve, figure 10 to any, essentially showing that when we go beyond a certain point, um, we have we in the training data set increases the risk or problems of the model. There was a note somewhere that I wanted to point out. Essentially, we have we had the same concept in the earlier chapters, um, showing that. Uh, bias vari variance in section in chapter two, we talked about the bias variance trade off, and we had only one side of this, which was the left hand side. Now, here we, we can see that um, when the model gets more complex, uh, that single U, single uh, bias variance trade off, is, get, is getting more complex as the model gets more complex too. Okay, so that's how they end up uh, chapter, essentially mentioning that um, we don't need to always go all the way to the most complex version to have the better uh, have a better understanding of the data. And more complex method, more complex model means more complex problems down the road, or either for the training or finding the optimization, optimized parameters. And that's it. We get to the lab. What time is it? I'm gonna stop sharing. It's nice. <laughs> 10 minutes before it ends. <laughs> Thank I you for the presentation. Clear. Yeah. I feel they just like reading that chapter, right? I just feel they are like just touching the surface because I feel like after reading that chapter, I have a lot more questions about like their judgments, actually how they selected the parameters, those things. Mm -hmm. uh, then those are like things that I had to Google to figure out the answers. I feel like that whole chapter is really just an introduction to a deep learning. Yeah, I had the same feeling because if they keep, can't they, the authors constantly said, we are not going into the details. It's beyond the yeah. scope of this book. We, uh, if you want, if you want to study, you should go to this topic. Mm -hmm. Or there are like, um, if you want to do this, th there were a lot of incidents of stopping, not explaining because it yeah. was more complex. And mm -hmm.
Nile, do you have questions? <laughs> so no, I don't have any questions, but it was, yeah, thank you. Uh, for me, uh, basics are the best. <laughs> So thank you. Uh, it was really good for me to listen this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I hope it made sense. I I was always afraid that it was not co coherent. So I was afraid that it was broken down. So I hope it was co coherent. No, it was fine. For me. No, it was <laughs> so good in my opinion as well. Thank you. Uh, so. For next week, we have we can either do the lab just to see whether we can install stuff for like chapter 10 to see how it works out the lab mm -hmm. or we can proceed to the next chapter, which which do you guys prefer? Yeah. <coughs> like do you want my to suggestion? Lab? For me both Did is I? fine. I can start with uh, the other chapter because I have so I mean much more time than before, so I believe that I can have time to prepare. Mm -hmm. But if I mean we can continue with the lab as well, but we can start the new champ chapter as well. My suggestion is let's see if we can get this to work. If it mm -hmm. we could, maybe we can start the beginning of the. Um, meeting like the first maximum 30 minutes on the labs okay and then um nilai could go to for the second 30 minutes nilai could go through the mm -hmm. chapter 11 yeah okay yeah so yeah. let's see how does it sound yeah it sounds good uh, i'll try to see if i can get it work on my arm <laughs> over the weekend so i'll post it in the slack like to let you guys okay so Okay. Oh, I, um, yeah, I can. If not, I will just try on Adlin because I have VS Code installed. So, I, if not, then the worst scenario is we just try to do it on Python. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's see you guys next week. Okay. See you Thank next you. week. Have a good day. Bye. You, you too. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.